Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, uh, we really left off with verse 40, but I want to start back with verse 39 because it kind of sets the stage here. He says, uh, uh, you search the Scripture. Who's speaking here? Jesus is speaking, and, he, and who's he, who is he talking to? Yeah, he's, he's talking to the Jews. It's interesting. I think we made the point last week, though, that it's probably for the benefit of a lot of other people in the crowd that he's saying some of these things. But he says to these Jews, you, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Okay, the way he says this in verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think it's going to lead to eternal life. That sounds like an indictment, doesn't it? That just the way it's worded, it sounds like he's saying, hey, you think you're going to be alright with God because you do this. But you're not alright with God. Okay, it leads me to ask the question, however, can you search the Scriptures and be alright with God? Yes, it's an indictment because of the way they search the Scriptures. And that's the reason I think I gave these references last week. But in Luke, the 24th chapter, the 44th verse, uh, Luke 24 is that famous story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus meeting the two disciples and how they're uh, downcast after Jesus' resurrection. They're downcast after Jesus' resurrection. I, you know, <laughs> uh, Jesus rose from the dead. And that would be like, whoa, <laughs> right? Uh, why are these guys downcast? What? Why are, yeah, down he goes. Uh, why are they not excited? Jesus is our, the reports have already come that Jesus has risen from the dead. Do you, rem do you remember the story? The two on the road yeah. to Emmaus, you remember this one? Okay, they, they are upset the because, Testament. say what? They didn't understand the Old Testament. They did not understand the Old Testament. And they're, he's going to find that out in a minute. The reason they're downcast, though, is they've heard these reports that Jesus has risen from the dead, but obviously they didn't, didn't believe it yet. I think that is very significant because too many people in their modern day thinking, we have, uh, I don't remember where I heard this from, uh, one of my teachers, uh, in fact, I'm gonna butcher it, I'm not gonna use the right term, but, but the way I would say it is, we have a modern day snobbery because we think, all the people who lived in times past were stupid. <laughs> and we're the people who understand things today. And we often think that way of ancient civilizations a long time ago. And in the first century, in the first century, they were not stupid. Uh, they did not, when they heard news, Jesus rose from the dead, they didn't just automatically, hey, he rose from the dead. Did everybody believe it? No. They were very much like people would be today. If somebody came in this room and said, oh, remember the person who died last week? Oh, they came back to life. And we would all say, whoa, that's great, that's wonderful. No, most of us here would say, you didn't take your medicine, did you? <laughs> <laughs> right? Because we know that's not the norm. Those kind of things don't happen. That's the way it was in the first century as well. I think that adds credibility to, to uh, uh, what the Bible talks about because the people who finally did believe the reports of the resurrection were so con had to be convinced of it. In fact, remember what Thomas said? He wasn't there when, he, when they saw Jesus. What did he say? Yeah, I'm not going to believe until I can put my fingers in the hands, my hand in the side. Then I'll believe. The uh, rest of you guys are not jobs because you believe <laughs> this. But, but not me. I'm the only reasonable person. I know I'm at living. But that's kind of that's kind of thing. Okay, back to the road to the road to, on the road to Emmaus, these two were downcast and they didn't even recognize Jesus when he's walking with them. In fact, when did they finally recognize Jesus? Yeah. At the meal. And as soon as he recognized Jesus, then Jesus. Yes. But on the road, before they understood Jesus, when they gave their report and they were so downcast, they couldn't believe it, they're having trouble believing it, Jesus chastised them. Are you so slow in understanding what Moses and all the prophets have said? Moses and all the prophets verified Jesus' ministry and what was going to happen to Jesus. Later, afterwards, these two commented, 
while Jesus was explaining the scripture to them, their comment was, what? Oh, oh how our hearts burn. Okay. I, you may get that. I'm just going to tell you, for years, I didn't get that. I was kind of like, they had heartburn. Yeah. They, <laughs> they were bothered. This term, when it talks about their hearts burned within it, in them, it's kind of this welling up that you get inside when you're when when your team is running and it's 20 yards, 15 yards, 10 yards, and it's like two seconds left, and it's like we're really gonna win. And it's not like when they go to the end zone and then you explode. Well, that feeling that you get that that that's what I think is being described here. How our hearts burn with it is this excitement. Wow, can this really be true? Okay, a long diversion just to make the point. Does the scripture testify about Jesus? It most certainly does. The reason I really wanted to make that point though, one of the points I think Jesus is really bringing home here, all the evidence in the world set before you isn't going to convince you if you don't want it to convince you. Have, have, I, have I told you my... My, my story of my philosophy professor at Western Kentucky University, I, I, I apologize for this if I told you before, but this, these kind of things have always stuck with me. He's talking about the guy who thought he was dead, and all of his friends were trying to convince him, you're not dead. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, I'm dead. And they finally got to the point in the conversation where they were trying to give him some evidence proof. They, they said, would you agree that dead people don't believe? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And so they, they pulled out a pen real quick, and they stuck him in the hand, and he started believing. They said, see? You're not dead. And he goes, well, what do you know? Dead people do believe. <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard that story. Right? It was poorly told, but I've always appreciated the point it makes, and that's this. Some people that are so convinced of something, it doesn't make any difference how much evidence you prove, get, you provide for them. They're just going to do that. I think that's really one of the things that's going on here. I think Jesus is making a point you don't want to believe, and hopefully in the next few verses that, that will become a little more clear. Um, he, he is making the point, though. He says, you think you have eternal life by studying these scriptures, but these scriptures testify about me. Can, can I say it this way? As long as you've come to the conclusion that it can't be Jesus, then you're not going to understand the scriptures, and you're not going to come to the conclusion that you could. That you should. That all the scriptures are pointing to. Okay, the other reference would be uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the second half of the chapter, and he even mentions it a little bit, the beginning of the fourth chapter, Talks about the Jews being veiled. He plays off the idea who wore the veil in the Old Testament? Who was the man who wore a veil? Why did Moses wear a veil? Okay, not just because he was glowing. Do you remember the specific reason why he put? He was glowing. So they couldn't see that it was diminished. Yeah, so they couldn't see it fading away. That's exactly right. So he, he wore this veil. Uh, the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, plays off that that concept of being veiled and says Jews today who, just like here in John, refuse to see Jesus or try to study the Old Testament without Jesus in it, it's like they're reading it with a veil over their face. They're not getting the full picture. Okay, uh, verse 40, and you, are, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. This is, this is where uh, I, I think that's uh, he's more than implying. He's saying, you guys don't want to. You, you don't want to know. I do not receive glory from men. Okay, be, be careful how we read some of these things. And sometimes going through too slowly, like I'm doing right now, it, it, it failed to get the whole picture. He is going to take the testimony of some men, like John the Baptist, like Moses, like Abraham, the point here is it's not just man. There's so much more than that. The word glory, we've talked about this before because it's one of my favorite terms. From the in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the term glory means do you remember this? Weight. Weight. Significance. Significance. Really like that. In the New Testament, the term glory is it's the Greek word doxa. And it's it's very rich. It doesn't have the exact same flavor as the Hebrew word, but they both are, are parallel concepts. Uh, the word doxa, the idea of glory, uh, we talk about when somebody dies, they're a Christian, they've gone on to glory. You ever heard anybody say that? 
very appropriate because the term glory, this doxa idea, is the idea of it's perfect, it's the way it should be. Can't get any better than that. Yeah, in all their glory. And that's exactly what Jesus say. I, it says. He does not receive glory from men. But up to this point, he's saying scriptures give him that glory. God gives him that glory. There's a lot of things that testify to the fact that he is who he says he is. Uh, which, by the way, he's answering the charge. Uh, he claims to be the Son of Man, making himself equal with God. And his response is pretty much, yeah, that's right. I am equal with God. Verse 42, but I know that you, uh, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Okay, back up to verse 42 when he says, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. The word for love here is the most common word for love. It's agape. If you were really... Hmm, uh, give me a definition of the word agape. Disinterested benevolence. Okay, okay. Uh, and from the... Especially if we compare it to the other words for love, it's... Uh, I hate to say this one because this is not... This is not really fair. But it's... Let me go ahead and say it and then I'll try to correct it, okay? It's not the emotional word. It's not the, just the flutter of the heart. It's not the being overwhelmed with the emotions. Your emotions are very much involved, but it's more than any other words. It's more of a commitment. It's a, you, you know what, that's the right thing to do, and I'm going to, I'm committed to do what's best for the person that I have this kind of love for. Okay, I find that very telling the way it's used because even though it's the number one used word for love in the New Testament, it was not the dominant word for love in a lot of Greek writings of the time. Just like, just like the word uh, humility. There, there are several words like this that, that just kind of overwhelm me. If I understand this correctly, the authors of the New Testament are the first ones to use the Greek word for humility in a positive light. Now that's, a, that's kind of a bold statement. I have not checked that out, but that's what I've read it from people that I do trust. And you know what? I'm not too surprised based on, on what I know about Greek culture and a lot of the other Greek writings. Humility was something that was often very much looked down upon. But in the pages of Scripture, it's a virtue. God's opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. In the same respect, agape was not always the kind of love that was really promoted as, hey, this is the most important kind of love, until you get to the pages of the New Testament. And in, in the New Testament, this is the this kind of love that God's really looking for. And that's the word that he uses here. He says, if you had that kind of commitment to God, I, to me this is really telling because they don't want to believe. And he's saying, you know what? If you were really committed to please God, you would get your ego out of the way, you'd get your own desires out of the way, and you would admit, okay, this guy really is from God. Look at the miracles, look at the testimony, look at... Uh, look at his baptism, look at what John the Baptist uh, said, look at everything else. He's got to be the one. But they don't have that kind of love for God, that kind of commitment to God. He said that in verse 43, he makes the point that he has come in the Father's name, uh, but you not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive, uh, you will receive them. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and read well, no, let me make a comment right now. Uh, this idea of, of, uh, of, of sometimes people come along with credentials or somebody else's testimony, and Jesus is going to say, he's introducing the thought right now, but he's going to say, you know what, if somebody comes along tooting their own horn, he says, more often than not, you believe it. You believe man's testimony, but you don't believe God's testimony. I think, I, personally, I think he's kind of backing up and coming at it again saying, you don't really want to believe, do you? It's a matter of not just belief. Belief is a matter of the will. We're talking about belief a lot, and that's one of the main purposes of the whole book. John's trying to explain to us uh, what belief really is and the kind of belief that God wants. And part of it is what you want, your will. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another 
and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Uh, they, they want uh, other people patting them on the back. They're looking for uh, the kind of stuff that uh, they shouldn't when they ought to be looking for what God points to, which would be Jesus in this case. Verse 45, uh, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who will accuse you is Moses. Of all the characters in the Old Testament, I, I kind of think he's put Moses off till now because he's building up crescendo here. It's one of their favorite characters in the Old Testament. He says, you guys really like Moses? If you like Moses, you would be listening to me if you listen to Moses. Well, he's, in so many words, he's already said that. This is emphasis by enumeration, backing up and saying it in different ways. Uh, the one who's going to accuse you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. It's kind of like saying before, if you really did follow the scriptures, you'd be believing me. If you listen to what Moses said, which part of the Old Testament did Moses write? First five books, the Pentateuch, that's right. Verse 46, for if you believe Moses, you believe me, for he wrote about me. Okay, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Where in those first five books did Moses write about Jesus? Genesis. Excuse me? Yes. Yes, very good. Very good. Uh, three Genesis three fifteen. Okay, uh, start in Genesis three fifteen. In any kind of reference to the messianic hope from the line of Judah, line of Judah, uh, all the way through uh, Deuteronomy, the eighteenth chapter, where he talks about the prophet that's coming is a direct reference to Jesus. There are several messianic prophecies. All those messianic prophecies would be Moses testifying about Jesus because he's the one who fulfills them. But you will not believe his writings. How will you believe my words? Okay. Uh, they obviously did believe some of the things that Moses said, but I, again, I think one of the major points that he's making is you pick and choose. You only focus on part of what Moses says, but you're not, you're not really listening to everything Moses said. And I, I really think this part of John the 5th chapter, the point he's making is, the reason you pick and choose is because you don't want to. You don't want to know. You know and why, why is it that sometimes people don't want to know? You know, we talk about burying your head in the sand. You know, <laughs> don't tell me. Don't tell me. I, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't take off women. But gonna, it's a men's study. I can do that, right? Um, I, I had a mother a few years ago was telling me about some of the problems she was having with her teenage boys. And she looked at me, and I think she was sincere. But she said, I just wish they'd lie to me. I just, I just wish they'd lie to me. I, I don't want to hear all this bad stuff they're doing. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, OK. But if they lied to you, it doesn't mean they didn't do the bad stuff. It just means <laughs> you're, you're just not dealing with it. OK, why is it people stick their head in the sand? Avoid responsibility. Responsibility. Which do you really? Well, in the short term. In the short term. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, it makes you think of that marshmallow study, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, okay, right now it may feel a little bit better, mm -hmm. but uh, you're hurting yourself in the long run. Yeah, in their case, uh, again, I don't want to push this too much. Uh, we're still in the early part of the Gospel of John, although we're getting down to the last year. Which doesn't say much for the Gospel of John because he spends a third of his book on one night. <laughs> okay, but we're getting down to the last year of the ministry. But up to this point, and since we've got the uh, other Gospels as resource here, what would you say would be the main motivator of why they didn't want to accept Jesus as the Messiah? Yeah. Like the way things were, they had their power and their system. You know, yeah. their they yeah. The last thing they wanted to do. Yeah, they did like the way things were in. Part of it is the power. I think that's a lot of it, yeah. He didn't fit their idea of the Didn't fit their idea. Yeah, uh, didn't fit their idea. Uh, can you think of an analogy Jesus used about molds? Or wineskins? <laughs> As close as I can come back with the parallel. What did, what did he say about wine skins? Yeah, what happens if you put new wine in old wine skin? 
that low. Do you remember the other metaphor, the other analogy he used right next to that uh, wine skin metaphor? That's exactly right. Why don't you put a new patch on an old garment? If, if one's gone through the shrinking process and the other one hasn't, you know, the first time you <laughs> wash it, first time wet and dry, you're going to tear it. Okay, what's the point he's making with both of those? Yeah, you got your own, you got your own concept, your own mold. This is the way it has to be. I'm glad you brought up this idea because in uh, the sixth chapter, the very next chapter we're going to, they definitely had an idea of what the Messiah was supposed to be. I think there's a little bit of difference, just my opinion here, I think there's some good evidence for this, though. but I think there's a difference between the religious leaders and why they didn't accept Jesus. I, I, personally, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, they were content and especially their power, but for the masses, I think there was uh, didn't fit the mold is is I think you hit the nail on the head right there because they were looking for somebody to sit on David's throne literally and uh, take care of the Romans. And, uh, yeah. yeah, we're going to see that because Jesus real he's going to say in the sixth chapter he knew the crowds wanted to take him by force and make him king. He knew that, and so what does he do? He leaves. Because <laughs> you know what, uh, your idea, what you want, is wrong. Even his followers were struggling. Even his followers. Even his, that's that's one of the reasons I like this. I'm holding this up because this is the sixth chapter. Okay. <laughs> um, that's one of the reasons I so like the way the sixth chapter ends. Uh, everybody else leaves, and he turns to the twelve. And Peter sometimes sticks his foot in his mouth. Sometimes, maybe. That's what he shouldn't, like a little amount of transfiguration and things like that. But this is one of the best, you know, this is this is one Peter can put on the resume. Because right? what does he say when Jesus turns to him and everybody else has left? He says, you guys want to leave too? Yeah, you alone have words of life. So even though the disciples, the disciples didn't, we find a lot of evidence, they didn't get it, but they did get this. Even though we don't know, and even though this doesn't make sense to us, we know that you're the one that's right. And boy, that's the, that's the most important thing. Okay, uh, let's jump into the sixth chapter. Unless any other comments or questions on the fifth chapter? Yes, John. I would just like, if, if you wouldn't mind, elaborate on agape for a moment. Would you agree or disagree uh, that, strictly speaking, it has nothing to do with emotions, but rather to general good willing, choosing the highest good of God in the universe according to their intrinsic value. In other words, you may not have good feelings towards somebody, but nevertheless you can act to do good to them, and yet your feelings wouldn't be congruent. Because I've had a discussion with somebody, saying, oh, that would be sinful if you had your feelings weren't in accord or congruent with your action. And I don't see it that way. I mean, I, I think if God would be pleased in spite of your feelings, which may be a natural reaction to some injustice, you'd go ahead and still do good to that person. Yeah, yeah. I, was I am, you I am very much inclined to agree with you. I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure I would uh, draw a firm line there though. I, I don't think I would say it's just commitment. However, I feel very comfortable saying that's the main emphasis. Uh, I, 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 I personally think that uh, it's not totally devoid of emotion. But that's not what you're conveying when you use this word. You're conveying the idea that, that I am committed uh, to do what is best for the person that I'm loving here. So it is a commitment, yes. Doesn't Jesus say to agape your enemies? Yes. I mean, how, how could you? <laughs> yes. I mean, it's gonna be hard for me to turn I, I have no problem around. saying that, uh, what you're saying. I have no problem at all. I just wouldn't be 100%, it's not emotion. I would say that is not the main point of this word. But couldn't your emotions be somewhat in conflict with your... I very much agree emotion. with that statement too, okay. because sometimes your heart's not in it, your emotions, mm -hmm. and you're going to do it anyway because you know it's the right thing to do because you agape somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the one quick 
word of caution that I would add that has nothing to do with the comment you just made. But I've heard too many times as a preacher, yeah, I've even heard this, I'm going to go back to moms, because I've heard moms say this again. <laughs> and moms aren't here, so I'm picking on them today. Because <laughs> I've got to be nice to them Sunday. This Sunday, you remember what this Sunday is? Right. Very good. Just a reminder there. Okay. Um, uh, I've heard too many people say, and you've probably heard this too, well, the Bible tells me I've got to love you, but I don't like you. <laughs> okay. That is not true. And we made that point before. It is not true. Because the Bible says that we are to agape and, in fact, this is in the list of the, uh, uh, where is it, Second uh, Peter, the first chapter, where we talk about uh, add to, in that Second Peter chapter 1? Always get it goofed up if it's First Peter yeah. or Second Peter. But Second Peter, the first chapter, talks about all the virtues we're supposed to have in Christ. Mm -hmm. And it talks about not just agape, it doesn't use that term, just that term there, also it says phileo. In fact, that, that's, it's not just there. There are several places. Agape is the number one thing emphasized, but we're also supposed to fillet one another, which means the commitment, and we're also supposed to work on liking each other too. Right. But the, uh, back to the point you made, I, I would not disagree with you. Can I say it that way? Yeah. I do think agape is focused on the commitment. I would call, I Which, by the way, I don't understand why somebody would would be upset with that. I don't understand how that could be. What did you say? They said it, it was a sin. That it has. You have to have. Yeah, it would be sinful not to have. If, if you're doing something, you have to feel the, to want to do good in order to be a loving act. And I said no. And that, that they could be totally yeah. separate. I was. I recall this story about. I think it was the 16th century when Christians, you know, where heresy was a yes, reasonable yes, yes. offense. Yes. Uh, some man was in prison for heresy and mistreated, and he was able to escape in the winter time. And as he was seen running away, one of the guards went after him and ran over a uh, body of water, fell through the ice. The guards, the other guy, had made it save the cross. Guy turns around, sees him, thinking, "I like this story." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he goes back, he pulls the guy out, and then he's recaptured. They take him back and eventually put to death. I mean, I would call him that sort of the guy was struggling for right. what do I do? Here's this guy that's been mistreating him. God wants to do the right thing. Yes. And he may not have had the kindest feelings for yes. this person, nevertheless. I mean, I would think God would be very pleased when our emotions might be telling us, oh, and yet you go ahead and choose the highest good for that person. Yeah, you, you, you bring one other thing to mind because what does the Bible say about listening to your heart? Yeah. Right. Yes. Oh, boy, there's a lot of strong warnings there. Uh, in, in not just the uh, Jeremiah 17 9 isn't that the one that the heart's more deceitful than everything else but above all things but first John chapter 3 verse 20 God is greater than your heart because sometimes your heart's not going to be in it but you've got to do uh, what God wants you to do anyway in fact uh, there's some other scriptures that go along with that. I was going to say if we waited until we felt it to do what's right yeah. <laughs> you know, I, that's, that would be the answer to me is like, God doesn't want me to wait till I feel it. It's like me and the artwork. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> right. Art. right. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I don't want to do it or I don't feel it, I'm still going to do it. Amen. Good. So that would be why I, I would tell that person, you can't be a sinner because I'm doing the will of God. Even if I haven't learned it. Yeah, and, and I have to be careful because I tend to overemphasize this. Our hearts are very important to God. And uh, I think this last part of the fifth chapter kind of underscores that because your heart, your will, you don't want to you don't want to believe something, guess what? You're probably not going to believe it. Right. But our heart's not, I love the way Brian Myers used to say this, your heart's not meant to be driving the bus. <laughs> you know, it's it's okay to be the caboose on the train. It's not meant to be the engine. So it's it's a, it's it's an important equation. But don't make your decisions based on it. Yeah, back over here. Uh, the only thing I was thinking about as he was talking about this um, idea of whether your heart and feelings are involved, I could see where there would be a situation of if you're doing something because the church says to, and that's the only reason you're doing it, not because you're actually trying to do good yourself. Like, an example would be like if the church says, you know, go out and talk to a random person, you know, 
and like everyone tried to go out this week and talk to a random person and tell them you know the good news if you do it only because the church said to not because you actually wanted to talk to someone a random new person and try to spread the word you know if you're doing it like i can see there being you know because you don't really want to. You, you don't really have any something. interest in doing it other than... Okay, I've got, to, I've got to carry it one step further, though. It depends. Your heart may not be in it, but do you want your heart to be into it? Right. You know, because sometimes you don't want to, but you want to want to. Right. Okay, on that, let's go to the sixth chapter. <laughs> remember, that, that, remember uh, who was it who said to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief? I think that's a classic. Who was it? No, that was when they came down. Uh, uh, Thank you. The father of the son who the nine couldn't drive the demon out of. Okay. Yeah, I I, I love that statement though because it's uh, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. I think that's so important. Okay. Uh, chapter six. There's been a. Uh, long break between chapter 5 and chapter 6. We read about it. Uh, chapter 6 is mentioned, what ha takes place there? It's mentioned in all four Gospels. Uh, why is that something I'm mentioning here? Because I, I find that very significant because John typically doesn't need to repeat what's in the other Gospels. Uh, but there are some things that are in all four Gospels. I, I think this major point. Uh, uh, John is going to, he's, he's really helping us understand belief. And he's going to do that through major signs. There are seven major signs during the public ministry. There are more than seven major signs in the Gospel of John during the public ministry. How many have we had so far? Back in chapter 2, what was the sign in chapter 2? The very first one. Water and wine. Water and wine. That's the first one. The second one comes in chapter 4. In chapter 4, you usually think of woman at the well. Well, that's not the sign. But after the woman at the well, what takes place at the end of the fourth chapter? Healing at a distance of the royal official servant. That's right. That's the end of the fourth chapter. Here in chapter 6, we're going to have two more signs. Oh, I, I skipped chapter 5. So we got chapter 2, chapter 4. What happened in chapter 5 that's a sign? Man. Lay man for 38 years. 38 years, right? Healing of lay man. Chapter 6, what are the two signs going to be in chapter 6? Feeding of 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water. Very, very significant chapter. It's feeding of the 5,000 that all four Gospels uh, record for us. Hopefully I'll remember to say some of the details as we're going through these verses. It says in verse 1, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. Sometimes Sea of Galilee is referred to as Tiberias. I'm glad that most of the time they refer to it as the Sea of Galilee because one of the towns on the Sea of Galilee is Tiberias. So it helps to just call the town Tiberias and the Sea of Galilee. Uh, verse 2, A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Jesus already said this. He said it in chapter 5, verse 36. He's going to say it again over in chapter 10. But he said the signs, if you really saw the signs, you'd believe me. But sometimes he talks about seeing the signs and says, that's the only reason you're following me, it's because of the signs. Sometimes they just see the healing and the service, and they don't see what the sign points to. And I think that's the emphasis that Jesus is really giving when he chastises people for not seeing the signs. These crowd, this crowd, I think we're going to see is a very good example of people who just saw the billboard and didn't see where the billboard was pointing. All they saw was, wow, <laughs> this guy can heal the sick, he can do all sorts of great things. Uh, they didn't take it the next step and say, what does that mean? No, they're just focused on that. Okay. They saw the signs that he was performing on those who were sick. Verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Luke chapter 9 and Mark chapter 6 tell us that, that what he's doing with his disciples, this is before the crowds get there, 
He's getting a report from his disciples. Where have his disciples been? That's exactly right. He has sent them out on a mission. They've come back, and they're given their mission report. And so Jesus is listening to the report of their mission that he sat down the, uh, with his disciples. It says, uh, verse 4, John gives us a, a marker here, a time marker. He says, the Passover feast of the Jews was near. Okay, if we're counting, we're in chapter 6, but this is the third Passover. Third Passover. We're entering into the last year, year and a half, uh, not year and a half, the last year of Jesus' ministry. Because the fourth Passover is one of the Last Supper, crucifixion, resurrection. And how long does Jesus stay after the resurrection? Forty more days. That's right. Okay. So this is the Passover of the last year. It's near. Uh, reason that's significant? People are traveling to Jerusalem. Where is Jesus? What lake? Sea of Galilee. Thank you. Crowds are going to be heading south because the Passover is near. Verse 5, Therefore, Jesus lifting up His eyes and seeing a large crowd was coming to Him. Okay, where have you seen this before where Jesus looks up and He sees a large crowd? And He's talking with His disciples. Where is this? Woman at the well, Sychar. Uh, she went back and told them they come out. Jesus, at that point, talks about the field being white at the harvest. He says, uh, here's an opportunity. Jesus sees another opportunity with these people coming. Uh, I, I'd like to plant this seed. The opportunity he sees here, before, in the fourth chapter, the opportunity he's, I, I think that was focused on is, okay, we just got through talking about water with the woman and bread with his disciples. My food, my bread is through the will of the Father. Right? I think he's challenging his, the disciples just like he challenged the woman at the well. Do you really want to please God? Well, look. Here are a bunch of people coming. Here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for you to really show if your food is due to the will of the Father. You've got an opportunity to say that. Here, I think the, it's, it's not so much on the crowds. Again, like the fourth chapter, he was challenging his disciples. Here, I think he's going to challenge his disciples too. I think sometimes uh, when we just think of the story of the feeding of the 5,000, we think of, wow, what impression would this make on the 5,000? No doubt, make a great impression on the 5,000. I really see in the Gospels, though, Jesus is really trying to make an impression on 12 people. He's really focused on these men, and he's going to set it up. He sees the crowd coming. He said to Philip, uh, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? He said this to him to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Uh, typically, you think of tests, you think of school. Right? Well, this is a school relationship. These are his disciples. He's the rabbi. Time for a test. See if you're getting this. And we're in the last, we're coming up in the last year. He's been with them two years. Okay. Philip answered him, 200 denarii. Uh, do you have a footnote for this? What's a denarii? Day's wage. Day's wage. 200 days wages. We wouldn't have enough uh, to buy. With 200 days wages, we wouldn't be able to buy enough bread for them, for everybody to receive a little. What does it tell you about the crowd? There's a big crowd. Big crowd. Matthew's the one who tells us it's 5,000 men, <coughs> not counting the women and children. Uh, so your guess is probably better than mine as to how big this crowd is, but we're talking a very sizable crowd. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves. Don't let the word loaf, loaf, fool you. It's probably five crackers that size, okay? And two fish. The hint here would be this is a little boy. Why would a little boy be eating five loaves of bread? <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, I've seen little boys eat a lot of bread. <laughs> but this is probably five biscuits, five crackers, something like that, and two fish. But what are these for so many? Okay, I've got to ask this question. Why do you think Andrew's bringing this up? He asked, where are we going to get all this food? And Philip's the one who says, we don't have enough money for this. And Andrew comes up and says, uh, we got one, we got one meal. Do you think that shows some faith on the part of, I, I think maybe, uh, kind of, I, I put this, personally, I put this in the same category of when the disciples came back from Sychar buying, buying bread and they see Jesus talking to the woman, were they bothered by that? Yeah, did they say anything? No. <laughs> Didn't say a word. It's kind of like, okay, this, this doesn't seem right, but I'm not going to say anything. Are you going to say anything? <laughs> Maybe they know enough or have enough respect that they realize, okay, we don't know, but I don't want to, I don't want to question him. Okay, uh, tenuous, can I say it that way? Uh, verse 10, Jesus said, have the people sit down. Uh, Mark's the one who tells us in groups of 50 and 100, but he orders them to sit down. Now there, there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down uh, in number about 5,000. Uh, and again, Matthew tells us there's women and children. I forgot to mention this. When Andrew said, here's one with a meal, the thing that's remarkable to me is he already told us that the Passover. That makes sense why there's such a large crowd coming by. He also told us that the people saw what Jesus was doing, healing. So a lot of the people on the way, if they happen to see Jesus, of course they're going to swarm there. The thing that's remarkable though is how are so many people taking a trip without food? Where is this taking place? Around the Sea of Galilee. And where are they going? Jerusalem. Hey, honey, let's go to California. Is there any gas in the car? No, let's go. <laughs> just hop in a car and go. I don't know. I just find this remarkable. Because you already know what's going to happen. We know this, right? When they have food left over, where do they put the leftover food? In baskets. How many baskets? Where'd they get these baskets? Most Jews in that day on a journey would carry a basket. It would look like a backpack. You know why most Jews would carry a basket? Not for their clothes. For food. You know why they carry a basket for food? It's a long time. It's a long way. And guess what? If we don't have the right kind of food on the way, if we eat some stuff we're not supposed to eat, what does that mean once we get there? It means we can't celebrate the Passover feast. We're ceremonially unclean. So most Jews in this day, especially on a trip to a feast, would carry acceptable food so that you make sure that you're not stuck and you're not ceremonially unclean when you get there. Because you remember, there, you couldn't eat catfish. Right? So if they're selling catfish. There, there are certain kinds of food you're allowed to eat, certain kinds of food you're not allowed to eat. I'm, I'm just telling you, I find this remarkable that we've got probably 20,000 people or more, 5,000 men, they've got their baskets, and nobody else has got food. I, I think there's more than just, I, I know there's a major miracle here, but I think there's a lot going on with this. Okay, uh, let's pick up. In verse 11, we find out we have uh, 5,000 men. Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also the fish, as much as they wanted. All we know is he takes one meal and somehow, he doesn't go into details, that's not the point, but somehow, some way, the food supply never ran out. Okay, I don't want to speculate too much because the Bible doesn't say this, but do you remember Elisha, the prophet, who was a, a wife of one of the prophets who died, and she didn't have enough money to pay her bills. And so Elisha said, do you have anything? She goes, well, I've got a little jar of oil. 
And he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go borrow all the containers you can borrow. So she borrowed all these containers from all her neighbors. And what, what was she instructed to do? You start pouring. Have you ever seen those magicians take a little thing and they keep pouring and it just keeps... I went to went with the grandkids to Ripley's, believe it or not, in St. Augustine this past week. We did the tour of St. Augustine. And outside of Ripley's, they've got this faucet hanging in the air. And the water never stops coming out of this faucet. It's amazing. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Have you been there? Have you seen that? Okay. Uh, anyway, she... She kept pouring, and bring me another pitcher. And it kept pouring, even another jar kept pouring. When did the oil run out? When the last container was full. Okay, that's all the story says. As a kid, I'm always thinking, I bet you she wishes she would have gotten more containers. <laughs> Why didn't I get the 300 gallon tote from my neighbor? <laughs> but what did Elisha tell her to do with all the containers? Go and sell it. She was able to pay off her debts and take care of her family as a result of it. Okay, why do I bring that up? Maybe, maybe it was one of those kind of things where every time your hand went in the basket, there was just another piece of bread. Bible doesn't emphasize that. That's not the important part. The important part is a miracle took place, but the Bible does mention Jesus prayed. He prayed before his meal, but it doesn't just say he prayed. What did it say? He gave thanks. He gave thanks. Why do I find that significant? I find that very significant because... 1 Timothy chapter 4, the first three verses, the first verse says the Spirit clearly says, in later times, some will abandon the faith, teaching doctrines that shouldn't be taught, uh, doctrines of demons, you remember this? Uh, their conscience has been seared, it's with a hot iron. He talks about the fact that people are really going to get away from the faith. And here's two examples he gives. The very first example is they're going to tell people what? You're not allowed to get married. It's the first example of people getting away from the faith. Forbid people to marry. And example number two, he said, he said, forbid them to eat certain foods. Okay, let's finish that verse. Forbid them from to eat certain foods which God, what? Intended to be received with thanksgiving. He doesn't just say, oh, it's okay to eat those foods. He, he really makes the point in 1 Timothy chapter 4. God intended for you to be able to eat those foods if you say thanks. <laughs> okay, that's my emphasis there. <laughs> We're supposed to say that. That's the example we have from Jesus. He says thanks. Uh, that, that's why I like it when people say, who's going to give thanks instead of just saying, who's going to say the prayer for the food? Because that is the biblical thing that's being emphasized here. Let's say thank you. Let's say thank you at our, at our meal time. Okay. Um, he did. He gave thanks. Distributed the food. They have enough. In fact, they have more than enough. Verse 12, when they were filled, he said the disciples gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Do you think there's a lesson here? Okay. At least at one level, don't be wasteful. How much did they gather up? Verse 13. So they gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets full of the fragments. Okay, I didn't mean to leave that other one. Why did he want to gather all this up? Probably because not to be wasteful. But can you think of another reason why he would want people to keep the leftovers? There's a long trip to ahead of them. To, to me, again, I think of what happened at the wedding feast. He didn't just make wine for the wedding. If you calculate, do you remember how large those jars were? Didn't we calculate this? There would be enough for something like 14,000 cups worth of wine. Was it 1,400 or 14,000? There was a lot. I forget. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. But a whole lot more than in all likelihood that they would have at the wedding day. And it set me to thinking, well, if these people ran out of some basic supplies at a wedding feast, maybe Jesus wasn't just saving the day. Maybe he was blessing them with something that after the wedding was over, they could sell in the marketplace. Uh, maybe Jesus can 
wanted to continue to bless these people on their trip. Maybe it's so that in the future, when they're eating the leftovers, they'll remember, yeah, this is, this is the leftovers from a few days ago, and remember what took place. Nonetheless, he told them to take the fragments, and they filled up 12 uh, large baskets, but these are not as big as the ones mentioned over in Mark chapter 8. Uh, after the feeding of the 4,000, seven baskets. The, the seven baskets in Mark chapter 8 would be huge, would be hamper size, the, the note that I've got here. Left over from those who had eaten. Verse 14, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, the miraculous feeding from one uh, lunch, they saw the sign they performed, they said, this this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. The prophet. I think that's a clear reference to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Right? One like Moses, which is a messianic prophecy. And I think at, at least at one level they get that. Here's the part. I know we're running out of time. In fact, we're, we're going to stop here because we've got another minute or two. But... but uh, we're getting ready to transition from the feeding of 5,000 to Jesus teaching the people. And it's as though the people are, oh, the good old days. What good old days? Oh, those good old days back in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, when we had manna every day and, and water. Wow, isn't that great? Yeah. You had manna and water and you're in the wilderness wandering around because you're not in the promised land. And the reason you're not in the promised land is because God's punishing you to allow you to die off. Okay? People just have a tendency to pick and choose memories and different time periods. Didn't Solomon in the, in, was it Ecclesiastes or Proverbs? Wasn't it in the Proverbs where he said, uh, don't say the good old days? Do you remember that? Uh, sometimes we have a, a, a problem with our memory. And uh, to me, it's very concerning. And I think one of the benefits of having uh, brothers and sisters in Christ is not to let somebody rewrite history in their mind. Um, okay, I didn't want to get off of that, but I, I do want to set the stage because they're going to—they're very much going to focus on what happened in the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness? Let me let me say one more thing, and then I'll throw it open, and we'll uh, we'll conclude. Uh, I always appreciate what Philip Yancey, uh, one of the comments that he made about this uh, wilderness experience, he said, if ever there was a generation that every single day saw miracles, signs and wonders, that would be your wilderness generation. Manna every morning, quail in the evening, uh, water from the rock. They, they saw the earth open up and swallow up people who... Uh, uh, Challenge the leadership of Moses and, and Aaron. Yes, thank you. Uh, they knew where to go because of the pillar of cloud or fire. It was just on a regular basis. And yet, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 points that very period of history and says, you know what? If their bodies were littered throughout the wilderness, they didn't make it. And I've always appreciated Yancey's comment because he said there are a lot of people who say, boy, if I just had a sign, if I could just see a miracle, everything would be great. He says, you know what? There's a generation who have more signs than any other generation. And none of them made it happen. It also makes you think of the uh, rich man of Lazarus, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. he said, oh, send somebody back from the dead. Mm -hmm. Remember what Abraham tells him? They're not going to believe. Even if somebody came back from the dead. From the dead. It kind of gets back to belief as a matter of the will. It's a matter of the will. Yeah, there are, there's evidence, but if you're not willing to accept the evidence, uh, it probably won't have the impact on the action. Uh, I'm talking too much. Questions, comments? What was that last Deuteronomy reference? 18. For the, yeah, chapter 18 is the uh, prophet. Likened to Moses. Thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, ha we have your word. You have given it to us as a light to our path. We are, we are so grateful. But as a result of sitting tonight, it just makes me, reminds me of how important uh, 
our choices are. You've also given us free will and what we want. And uh, I pray that even if our want is not where it should be, that we would want it to be where it should be so that we can better understand, that we can believe the way we want to believe, so that we can be the men of faith that uh, you're looking for when you return, that we can be the kind of men that uh, are responsible and, and uh, live the kind of holy lives that you've asked us to live. God help us as we try to do that. I pray in Jesus' name. Right. Uh, what verse did we leave off? 14. 14. Thank you.